This is what uh, Chicago's lakefront looked like when the first European settlers arrived. Obviously a rather romanticized painting, but uh, one that shows the North Branch and the South Branch of the Chicago River coming together to flow out into Lake Michigan. And for reasons that we'll describe more fully later, uh, that a sandbar uh, had been created at the north edge of that outflow uh, natural process. And that caused the main stem of the river to take a rather severe bend to the south so that it actually flowed out into the lake about where Monroe uh, Street is today. And so as soon as Europeans arrived, uh, at least at uh, Fort Dearborn uh, in, uh, what is that, uh, 1703, um, uh, they begin uh, altering the landscape of Chicago's lakefront by cutting through that sandbar so that the boats on the Great Lakes can get more easily into the river and uh, supply the new fort there. But it's really when Fort Dearborn is given up finally, uh, I think this is in the 1850s, I forgot to look up the exact date, that the federal reservation of the land east of State Street and north of Madison is finally given up and sold to the city of Chicago or transferred in some uh, way. That um, for whatever reason, uh, when they plat it out into blocks and house lots, they write on the plat about the area east of Michigan Avenue that it is public ground for, to remain forever open, clear, and free of any buildings. And that's an important provision that uh, is going to come into play in a big way in the 19th and especially the 20th centuries. But uh, almost as soon, Chicago makes a devil's bargain. Uh, the Illinois Central Railroad, everyone desperately wants for it to come to Chicago, but the Galena and Chicago Union already has the north uh, branch of the river uh, kind of tied up uh, with their facilities. The Rock Island has already made their way uh, in along the south branch of the river. And so the only entrance into the city that seems to be a convenient one for this railroad from the tip of Illinois to the top is along the lakefront. And this also conveniently solves a little problem for the young city, uh, which is facing winter storms that are battering the mansions along Michigan Avenue. The original shoreline, remember, is only 70 or 80 feet east of uh, the uh, Michigan Avenue. And so it's eating away uh, every winter at the land that uh, is between these mansions and the lake. And so just like we saw this past winter and we'll see again, uh, wealthy people very concerned about uh, preserving their private property. So uh, a deal is struck, some cash uh, into the pockets of Illinois legislators may have been involved, uh, but at any rate, the Illinois Central builds uh, north uh, along the shoreline and from uh, 12th Street, what we today call Roosevelt Road, north, all the way to uh, the uh, mouth of the river, basically, they are allowed to build a causeway out in Lake Michigan. And this is what it looks like in the 1850s. A, a bird's eye view from the 1890s shows how thoroughly that railroad and the uh, affiliated facilities dominated the uh, Chicago lakefront. So it was not at all the recreational and pleasure ground lakefront that we know today. Of course, these bird's eye views always included an improbable number of railroad uh, trains uh, steaming in and out of the city, as well as uh, every factory in full operation with the smokestacks roaring. But uh, nonetheless, the lakefront was a busy place with many hundreds of trains every day uh, chugging north and south uh, between that little strip of parkland and the actual waters of Lake Michigan. So this is what the South Lakefront looked like in um, 
the, the early 20th century, little more than a dumping ground. This is the lakefront that Daniel Burnham would have been looking at in the years after the World's Columbian Exposition. The city's harbor was the river. Because there were no breakwaters out in the lake yet, uh, it was not a safe place for the Great Lakes boats or smaller vessels transferring cargo to uh, anchor. The waves would have been too high, the threat from the storms too great. So instead they uh, came inland past the uh, obstruction center uh, pivot bridges and uh, tied up at wharves or keys on both sides of the main stem and the south branch of the Chicago River. Now that uh, started to change in the late 19th century as the um, uh, hmm. <laughs> as the sanitary and ship canal uh, was built. Uh, but I, uh, I hesitate to uh, pull back the curtain, but I'm pretty sure that uh, so this is the lakefront, the, the river that was the city's harbor. Ah, but something else happened. Uh, in the 1890s, and that is the creation of the, um, the World's Columbian Exposition on the South Lakefront. And so suddenly there's a newfound interest in the lakefront as a recreational rather than merely an industrial or uh, scenic facility. And in the years after the World's Columbian Exposition, uh, Daniel Burnham tries to interest the city in making a sort of a lakefront pleasure ground a permanent thing, uh, extending an offshore island from downtown all the way down to Jackson Park and, uh, and making scenes like this that had occurred during the Columbian Exposition. Uh, at the top, you see uh, people sitting on the foreshore enjoying the lake breeze on a July or August day. Uh, down at the bottom right, there was even a movable sidewalk that took people out onto a pier in order for them to uh, enjoy the cooling lake breezes. A fake battleship uh, had been built as part of the uh, Columbia Exposition as well. But I think that's uh, for another talk, another time about the uh, World's Columbia Exposition. At any rate, uh, Daniel Burnham, who had been the director of works for the fair, uh, starts quietly talking with people about an improvement, something along these lines that uh, by building offshore islands, uh, we could have a quiet lagoon that would be. Uh, safe for small, boat it, small boats and uh, create a lot of new recreational ground along the lakefront. He doesn't make a lot of progress with the city uh, leaders until uh, he finally returns from doing work elsewhere in the first part of the 20th century, comes back in 1907 and begins work on the plan of Chicago. Now the South Park Commission had been uh, doing some landfill work. Uh, right after the Great Chicago Fire in 1871, the debris was pushed into the lake in between the uh, original shoreline and the railroad tracks because that had become a kind of a stagnant lagoon. And so they were happy enough to just fill it in with the debris from the fire. Uh, stories that you sometimes hear about there being fire debris far north or far south along the lakefront, I just cannot see any basis for. There, there wasn't that much uh, debris to, be, uh, to begin with. It was never, not reused and uh, it really just filled this small lagoon downtown. And uh, the South Park Commission in the early 20th century, uh, really beginning in the 1890s, had been expanding Grant, Phil, I'm sorry, Grant Park by landfill activities, uh, taking, uh, for one thing, the uh, dirt from the freight tunnel system that some of you will know about that Chicago began uh, digging uh, right after the turn of the 20th century, uh, dumping that out in Lake Michigan to create a large part of Grant Park and uh, the very uh, 
uh, top end, uh, north end of Burnham Park uh, site for the Fuel Museum. So by 1929, this is what uh, Grant Park looks like with the extremely formal landscape around the centerpiece of Buckingham Fountain that of course we know today. This is the vision that Burnham presents uh, with the beautiful renderings by Jules Garin in the 1909 Plan of Chicago that we often uh, refer to as the Burnham and Bennett Plan of Chicago. So uh, this is how he envisions uh, my, my neighborhood down in the South Loop on a uh, warm summer evening like we're having this week uh, where uh, the lights are ablaze at the sidewalk cafes and uh, people are enjoying the breezes out in the park or a uh, little less of this this particular summer uh, on small uh, uh, sailcraft out in Lake Michigan. This is all part of a comprehensive view of the center of the city that is uh, in, uh, put forth in the plan of Chicago, uh, the various aspects in another very evocative rendering by Garan, uh, sort of a wintry sunset, uh, 5 p.m. sunset with the uh, sun uh, behind the snow-covered city. And uh, you see in the very center, the Civic Center proposed at Congress and Halstead, uh, new Congress Boulevard or Parkway cutting through the, the heart of the city to a cultural center that would have been out in Grant Park and then to new recreational and port facilities out uh, thrust out in the lake on new landfill. The combination of recreational and commercial port facilities was one of the things that was uh, strikingly innovative in the plan of Chicago. And so at left, uh, you see the plan uh, that is set out in the document itself. Uh, the red are railroad lines going out to these finger piers that with slips in between for the Great Lakes boats to uh, berth at. And along the north side of this long groin out into the lake uh, were to be recreational facilities for the public to enjoy. And when Municipal Pier number two is in fact built in 1916, the one that we call Navy Pier, they do in fact combine the commercial port facilities in the middle of the pier with the beer garden and the outdoor uh, promenades, even a ballroom for summertime dancing uh, uh, with the big windows that could be thrown open uh, out at the far end of Navy Pier. The lakefront is probably the most far reaching element of the plan of Chicago. Uh, other times, other places, I give a talk about uh, what actually came from the plan of Chicago. At the top is one of the renderings, again by Garan, from the plan, showing uh, not only the downtown lakefront, but then that long strip of offshore island uh, that would stretch all the way down to Jackson Park. And at the bottom is a modern map that I made. Uh, everything in green is man-made land, created almost entirely for recreational purposes by the South Park Commission and the Lincoln Park Commission, uh, with a little bit in the middle done for commercial reasons uh, for the water treatment plant and Navy Pier. Altogether, 1,800 acres, more or less, has been created by landfilling out in Lake Michigan. Here's the way that they did it. Uh, aerial view from 1927, uh, looking south from about uh, Cermak Road, I think, uh, or maybe a little further south because uh, there's East Tide Park at the, uh, near the back of the picture. And uh, you can see that they, they, put, they drive sheet piling out in the lake uh, where they want the eventual, eventual shoreline to be. And stacked up in the old days, the big blocks of Indiana limestone to surround what's going to be the made land. And uh, then they, uh, if they have solid fill material, 
uh, uh, things like the spoil from new basements being dug or the uh, uh, ashes from the coal burning furnaces of the time. Uh, they would carry that out and put it in this Lakeville area. Uh, as far as I can tell, they did not use putrescent household garbage, although I have found some newspaper articles that uh, refer to uh, being able to occasionally see uh, lettuce leaf or discarded tomato uh, in the new landfill that was going in. Uh, so it may be that some of the garbage haulers a century ago were uh, allowed to dump into Lake Michigan. But uh, we hope that there's nothing particularly to toxic that went in there. At any rate, uh, uh, when they ex had exhausted what they had to use to create the land, then they would uh, use these barges that sluiced up the sand and silt from the bottom of the lake. And they would dump that on top of this newly made land. And because that wet, heavy fill, uh, this. Uh, would uh, help to fill voids in the landfill and uh, it would also help to pack it down so that within a few years uh, you could uh, put certainly walkways, roadways, and even building foundations on this newly made land. Here is Promontory Point under construction. And here's a colorized picture of uh, Burnham Park. You can see the distinctive round outline of what will become Planetarium Point, Adler Planetarium there in the middle, and the shape of Burnham Harbor under construction, and over to the right, the stands of uh, what will become known as Soldier Field. And this is the process underway with some of the barges working there in the middle of the picture. Another South Lakefront uh, picture uh, where they are building the new overpass that uh, uh, I guess has been gone since the early 90s with the last expansion of McCormick Place there at uh, Cermak Road or Silverton Way uh, connecting down to the widened King Drive. And a lot of this South Lakefront landfill was used for the Century of Progress, uh, Chicago's second World's Fair, which uh, took place in 1933 uh, in the, oh, just the depths of the Great Depression, but was successful enough and enough of a bright spot for the nation that uh, they reopened it for a second summer in 1934. So these are some of the transportation group buildings uh, uh, well along uh, under construction in 1931 in the foreground, the uh, cable suspended roof of the transportation building and another one over to the left that uh, I believe was used for the railway exhibits. Uh, uh, a color a watercolor of the entire century of progress. Again, this is you know a whole other talk that I uh, sometimes do about the century of progress. And uh, recently there have been some color films that have come to light. We did not think that we had uh, any color photography of the century of progress. Kodachrome wasn't invented until a few years later. Uh, but uh, apparently there was motion picture stock already being used and there are color movies of the Century of Progress that you can easily find on YouTube. Uh, one of the uh, uh, sort of the signature uh, structure of the Century of Progress was the sky ride, uh, these rocket cars that um, I need to uh, look it up and see, but I believe these were rocketing across the Burnham Park Lagoon or Burnham Park Harbor at uh, oh, something like four miles an hour. Uh, they, it was not exactly uh, a speed that would uh, brush your hair back. Uh, here's an aerial view uh, a decade later, uh, actually 15 years later, of the 1948 Railroad Fair. Because the Century of Progress had been such a success out there on that part of the South Lakefront, uh, the idea of holding yearly expositions of one kind or another 
caught the attention of Chicago's business and civic leaders. And so in 1948, that was the centenary of Chicago's first railroad coming into town. And so they uh, mounted a big railroad fair. And I believe it actually returned for a second year in 1949. And then there was a pageant of progress in, I don't know, 50 or 51. And uh, General Motors had a touring show called uh, Motorama, where they would uh, display their big vehicles. Uh, the, another one uh, it usually went to smaller cities across the country, but I believe that they mounted Motorama or a related exhibit at least once. And at any rate, it, came, it became sort of implanted in people's minds that the South Lakefront was the place where expositions were held. And so uh, when civic leaders, including Colonel McCormick, the publisher of the Chicago Tribune, uh, begins really beating the drum for a big permanent expo hall in Chicago. Where do they choose? Not downtown near the hotels, but the mistake on the lake, the south lakefront there at Cermak, the foot of Cermak Road. The first McCormick place, of course, came to an ignominious end only a few years after it was built. Uh, important questions raised about why were there no sprinklers in a building this size? Um, had corners been cut in the, the building inspections, but those were brushed aside and Chicago raced to rebuild on the exact same foundations, what we today know as Lakeside Place, the, uh, the, the, the black modernist part of McCormick Place, and then that was supplemented in future decades by halls number two, number three, number four. So at this uh, point, it doesn't appear that McCormick Place is going anywhere. What uh, not everyone may know is that, uh, you know, only a portion of that long island that Burnham envisioned on the south side was ever built the South Park Commission uh, had kind of whittled it down and uh, value engineered that concept into a series of islands. Uh, there's a story in Chicago Magazine this month that tells a little bit of that tale. And uh, after World War II, among other cities around the world, Chicago offered Northerly Island as the site for the United Nations headquarters. Inexplicably, the United Nations declined to put its permanent meeting place downwind of the stockyards out in the, uh, among the ice flows of uh, wintry Lake Michigan, and instead chose a site offered uh, by the uh, Rockefellers in Manhattan. Uh, meanwhile, uh, a couple of years later, a uh, general aviation airport opened with great fanfare on Northerly Island. And some of you came, uh, know that it also came to a rather uh, curious end about 12 years ago in the dark of night as uh, Mayor Richard M. Daley uh, carved X's into the runways and uh, uh, decided that possession was nine tenths of the law and uh, he was closing that damn airport once and for all. So downtown, how much of our uh, lakefront is landfill? This uh, U.S. geological map on the left shows landfill in that mint green. And so you can see all of the landfill that we've already talked about done by the Illinois Central Railroad and uh, by uh, uh, other landowner, I'm sorry, by the uh, uh, South Park Commission creating Grant Park and extending it all the way out to uh, what the, it was originally called Field Boulevard on axis with the north facade of the Field Museum. But also you see Streeterville, what we call Streeterville. Uh, all of the landfill that was done uh, north of the river, east of Michigan Avenue. And over on the right is the same map that we've seen a couple of times already this afternoon, just putting it in context, talking about how much of the, the uh, lakefront is man-made in the dark green. Now, the story that is usually told by less careful 
tour guides is that all of Streeterville is somehow the result of this uh, uh, character with a capital K, uh, Captain George Wellington Streeter. And um, that he uh, ran his boat aground, uh, began encouraging people to do dumping, let the natural actions of the lake fill in all around him, created his district of Lake Michigan, uh, and uh, began uh, selling liquor on Sundays, uh, even trying to sell land to other settlers. Uh, it turns out that a lot of what we've been told over the years uh, was more fable than fact. Uh, Captain Streeter uh, was always happy to receive newspaper reporters in the final decades of his life. Newspaper reporting back in the days when Chicago had a half dozen competing daily, new, uh, daily and Sunday papers uh, could be as much a matter of stenography as careful reporting. And the result is that uh, the stories that got written down and printed, you know, you can't put it in the Sunday newspaper if it ain't true, right? Uh, are largely just the, uh, uh, shall we say, embellished recollections of Captain Streeter. In fact, what happened was the Lincoln Park Commission uh, reached a legal agreement with the wealthy landowners uh, that had riparian rights in Streeterville many of the names that are familiar from the streets that are out there today, like uh, Fairbanks uh, is the most prominent one that comes to mind. Um, uh, 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 trying to think of the, a couple of the others, but anyway, um, that th they did a trade-off. The Lincoln Park Commission could build its new Lakeshore Drive at a certain point out in the lake and the landowners who had riparian rights that extended out in the lake as far as a pier could be useful, uh, instead were given the authority to fill in and create this new land that they could sell between the natural shoreline that you see in a, a couple of different years on this map I made and this new shoreline or breakwater and fill line that the Lincoln Park Commission had established and gotten federal permission for. And so that's actually how our modern Streeterville got uh, created. But the Lincoln Park Commission was doing its own landfilling operations. Uh, they had begun in the 1880s, uh, modest by the standards of the 20th century, but where it was cheaper than buying land along the North Lake Front, they would create some land. And uh, so certainly by the 1890s, we already had uh, some causeway, well, uh, peninsulas, I guess we would say, that enclosed a quiet pleasure harbor, uh, which for some reason has a 22 on it. That may be a key number on this bird's eye view map. I've forgotten now. And uh, some other areas up and down uh, the older part of Lincoln Park. And so the, I love the colorized old pictures because they kind of uh, have an immediacy that is lost when we uh, look at the past in black and white only. Uh, th so this is uh, Lakeshore Drive in that area, this is probably just south of Fullerton today. And uh, you can see the lagoon over to the right that still looks very, very similar. In fact, you can bicycle, I think uh, at the moment, you're forced to bicycle uh, along the, uh, the side of that lagoon to, if you're going to continue anywhere between Fullerton and uh, Oak Street at the moment. Lakeshore Drive, uh, we had already talked about its beginnings in Streeterville and in the Gold Coast. Uh, here's a picture that I just found a, a week ago, a colorized version again. Uh, this is about at Burton, looking north of the original inner Lakeshore Drive. And uh, it, it looks like there might be an omnibus, a horse, uh, pulled omnibus back there in the background. I can't be entirely certain. And uh, the uh, uh, 1890s version of an Uber uh, there on the right. But uh, the man that was responsible for kind of creating that part of uh, 
the North Lake front was, of course, Potter Palmer. Uh, Mrs. Palmer, Bertha Honoré Palmer, lived in the lakefront mansion much longer than Potter was ever able to. But Potter had had the concept of buying what was considered worthless marshland and uh, doing some filling, creating a pleasure drive along the lake, and then encouraging his wealthy friends from Prairie Avenue to relocate, build new mansions up in what we today call the Gold Coast, because, of course, it's where those who owned the gold uh, were, lived next to the coast. And so here again, a colorized uh, version, but uh, the original Lakeshore Drive, uh, this might be a little bit north of Florida, I'm not entirely sure, uh, never nailed this one down, but uh, they've extended the foreshore a little bit further out into the lake. And uh, now you have a fairly wide pleasure drive. Of course, uh, no heavy Teamster wagons were ever permitted on Lakeshore Drive, and that's the origins of the modern prohibition that even uh, forbids uh, pickup trucks if they have the wrong kind of Illinois license plate from being on the drive. But um, uh, I've also heard a story that uh, I think it was Thursday evenings was reserved for fast driving on Lakeshore Drive, that the wealthy young men of the Gold Coast would bring their fastest trotting horses and a, uh, 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 and their most lightweight brougham over and uh, uh, do little exhibitions of speed. No wagering, please, merely an exhibition uh, about uh, who could travel along Lakeshore Drive the, uh, the most rapidly. Now the North Lakefront, um, was dramatically different than we think of it today. And this is kind of the, uh, the heart of the story that I'm telling, that, uh, you know, Chicago's shoreline a century ago was just not all that different than the way that we today think of, oh, let's say the beaches area of Toronto or uh, East Cleveland. Uh, so even on the north side, there were small commercial piers that had been built out into the lake. You can see them in red here on this map that I made for a forthcoming book about the legal history of Chicago's lakefront that'll be out next year. Uh, you can see how far the current shoreline is out from the lake. And uh, up at uh, Montrose, for instance, you're almost a full mile from the original shoreline as it existed in 1900. Uh, I just came across this image this week and thought I would throw it in uh, because it shows those private piers or perhaps they are merely uh, shoreline protection groins in uh, context of real estate development. So what you're looking at here is uh, area up in Rogers Park, as you can tell from the street names, uh, very close to Howard uh, Terminal of the Red Line there. And uh, the still the private riparian ownership uh, that some of those condos and uh, apartment buildings have on Lake Michigan uh, over to the east. But it is promoted as one of the things that you get if you are willing to buy property in Birchwood Beach is that you get riparian rights out into Lake Michigan. Uh, we'll mention riparian rights again in a, in a few minutes, uh, a little more context in Edgewater. So here is similar landfilling uh, operations going on up on the north uh, lakefront. Uh, I've already described the process of how they uh, uh, dump what they've got and then fill in the rest with the sand and silt from the bottom of the lake uh, and creating the sh uh, shoreline structures that will preserve the shoreline from the currents of Lake Michigan. And, uh, and uh, just check where I am. Uh, all right. But another important part of uh, talking about the North Lake Front in particular, it seems, is the history of the Outer Drive. The creation of the modern Lakeshore Drive 
one of the world's first urban superhighways, although uh, they would have thought of it as a parkway in the 1930s when they were creating. And um, so here is uh, what was described actually as the Cook County's first uh, grade separation project. So this is uh, North Avenue at uh, Lakeshore Drive, and you can see one of the double-decker buses run by the uh, Chicago Motor Coach Company. Motor Coach uh, was folded into CTA in 1953, well, uh, <laughs> purchased uh, uh, but by uh, CTA. Uh, but anyway, uh, this uh, this overpass is gone now, replaced by a more modern one as uh, Lakeshore Drive was rebuilt and extended in the 1930s. And I it just wrote about this a couple of years ago for the book Art Deco Chicago. Lakeshore Drive, uh, this is one of my favorite photos. It's a colorized black and white, uh, but just stunning to study the, uh, the details of uh, Lakeshore Drive being built in the late 1920s and uh, what it looked like. Uh, so there in the kind of the middle of this image is the Marine Hospital. Uh, the first Marine Hospital had been downtown and then the second one was built with these extensive grounds up here. And if, uh, unless I, I'm pretty sure this is where Walt Disney Elementary School is today. Uh, They're just north of Irving Park. So you see the landfill operations at this time uh, really only seem to go as far as Montrose. By uh, the late 1930s, they will have extended as far as Foster, and there they stopped for quite a while until uh, finally uh, extended to Hollywood in 1953 or four, I think. This is uh, the final extension because we, of course, we can see the old Edgewater Beach Hotel uh, over there, just north of Foster, about where the Breakers is today. And then all the way up at Bryn Mawr, you can see the pink apartment building, the Edgewater Beach Apartments, that is still very prominent there at, uh, uh, at Bryn Mawr and Lakeshore Drive. You also see that uh, originally the outer drive was built with these little cloverleaf interchanges. A few years later, uh, those were considered substandard, uh, just didn't have enough of a room for merging and uh, deceleration. So they were rebuilt as uh, the diamond interchanges that we know today. Here is the uh, end of Lakeshore Drive, uh, looking south, I'm sorry, I guess this is only the temporary end, but uh, another view of those, uh, they have those three darling little clover leaves at, uh, I'm trying to remember, Wilson, Lawrence, and Montrose, I believe, uh, and then uh, just came over to Foster, uh, which is why Foster still carries the US 41 label, even though the drive was later extended a little bit north. Now, Lakeshore Drive has its own charm and appeal as a work of modern architecture and landscape enhancement. Um, it is, of course, not a, a one-sided bar, or it is a sort of a one-sided bargain in that uh, it means that uh, we have all of those motorists out in the park for all time, it seems. Uh, on the other hand, uh, half the year in Chicago, uh, they're the ones who get to enjoy the view out over the lake much more than any of uh, the rest of Chicago does. But uh, we'll leave that, uh, for another, uh, that discussion for another time and just talk about some of the charming details that are there uh, on the overpasses, various places, pedestrian overpasses, uh, over to the left, the, this is essentially reconstructed concrete just done a decade ago down at 47th Street. And uh, I forget at the bottom, I can't remember if that is Fullerton or the original uh, North Avenue. Another uh, charming aspect of uh, Lecture Drive was the Passerelle, built in 1940. Uh, this was considered a masterwork of modern bridge design, appears in a book on that 
subject put out by the Museum of Modern Art, uh, but uh, this was later strengthened with some diagonal structural struts that uh, give it a rather different appearance today than it originally had, uh, though much safer when huge crowds are standing on it for the air and water show in the summer. Finally, North Lakeshore Drive and South Lakeshore Drive, then known as Leif Erikson Drive, were uh, linked together in 1937 with the opening of that big bridge, double level bridge, the lower level not completed until the early 1980s and uh, opened in a big uh, extravaganza uh, with a speech by Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, Chicago had become a big democratic town, supported his reelection uh, the year earlier, and so he actually came to Chicago to open this bridge in October 1937 and gave an important speech about the need to quarantine the aggressor in Europe. He is slowly, methodically building the case that the U.S. is going to need to put aside its isolationist ways and get involved in another foreign war. And indeed, he's proven correct. I picked a, a colorized postcard uh, of the infamous S-curve. This was criticized almost from the day it began. And the Park District's uh, defense of it was, well, it wasn't intended to be a cross-country superhighway. Uh, they thought that uh, as many people would be getting off as soon as they got to uh, what became Wacker Drive in the uh, 1970s or off at Chicago Avenue. They didn't apparently expect huge numbers of uh, vehicles going across through traffic and did not feel that it was a burden for them to slow for the two right angle turns. Generations of Chicago motorists thought differently and so finally in the early 1980s uh, under the leadership of John LaPlante uh, the city straightened out uh, the infamous Z curve or S curve there. This is what it looked like. Some of us are old enough to remember uh, when this part of the lakefront still was a pretty industrial and gritty part of Chicago uh, before it became all condos and uh, high-rise rental apartments looking over Millennium Park and uh, a gussied up lakefront connection. But we forget that uh, so much of downtown was just kind of uh, brushed aside as uh, quasi-industrial. The Park District allowed open-air parking on a huge portion of what we today think of as part of Grant Park. The legal situation was maybe a little different. I think the, the railroad uh, had a claim that because they had originally had tracks in this area, uh, they could uh, park the cars here. And, uh, you know, eventually uh, all of this gets, gets sorted out and we get uh, Millennium Park in this location instead. But uh, it's kind of astonishing to look at the old aerials that have the huge parking area north uh, between Monroe and Randolph, and then north of Randolph, sprawling railroad facilities. Uh, I still remember there being Illinois Central boxcars out uh, underneath Lakeshore Drive and all out in the area that is today Maggie Daly Park so that it could be claimed for tax purposes as railroad land. In fact, here's a, a picture of that very thing going on uh, there on the lakefront. The South Lakefront had had landfill, but for industrial reasons in large part. In the background or the middle ground of this photo in the haze there, you can see uh, the Rainbow Beach uh, water filtration plant done, I think in the 19th, late 40s, early 50s. The one up next to Navy Pier wasn't built until the early 60s. But in the foreground uh, is, of course, U.S. Steel's Southworks, a uh, picture about 1970 uh, when it's still bustling and belching smoke. Uh, uh, the EPA, I'm sure, has this uh, facility on their radar screen and uh, uh, using the new Clean Air Act signed the, uh, a couple of years earlier will uh, soon be coming for them. 
today Southworks is just vacant land and uh, the plans come and go for its reuse. Uh, I think it's really too far from downtown, which is about the only uh, growing job center that Chicago has for housing to be, uh, market rate housing to uh, uh, really work here, but uh, perhaps someone can put this together and uh, be able to re redevelop Southworks uh, in the near future. Uh, We'll see. One problem that Southworks has is that so much of it was created from slag. Now, slag is the impurities that are skimmed off of steel as it's being made. So when it cools, it forms a kind of artificial rock. And so you really ha would have to use a jackhammer to put foundations down into this or to uh, dig basements into it. But uh, it, that means that, you, you know, uh, it, uh, it doesn't heave the way that uh, other land in the, uh, up here in the Frost Belt does. So uh, uh, at any rate, uh, uh, but the other thing I wanted to mention was uh, with, in terms of Southworks is that there's a pretty severe drop off. Instead of building a shoreline that uh, tapers or, or slopes down to the water surface because it's going to have a bathing beach at the uh, east end of it, this was built for industrial reasons. And when you get to the east end of it, it's about a 14 foot drop. Maybe it's only a 10 foot drop at the moment, but still uh, that's uh, not an easy place to put a bathing beach or anything else other than maybe sailboat facilities. Some of you will remember the Nike uh, missile facilities that were up and down the lakefront. I think there were three of them in Chicago's lakefront parks. And uh, this is the, I believe, the one up at Montrose that eventually becomes the bird sanctuary because it is fenced off for so long after the federal government pulls the, ins the missile installation out that uh, the birds making their uh, uh, migrations along the shoreline of Lake Michigan uh, find it a welcome place to stop for the night. So this is, of course, today one of the um, uh, birding meccas of Chicagoland. But most of Chicago has come to think of the lakefront as a recreational playground with the pleasure boat harbors that were created with and part of the landfill operations in the teens and 20s. Uh, this, uh, this is Montrose, right? And uh, with Belmont down at the lower left. And uh, so the tremendous number of slips that, uh, for the pleasure boats that we have, as well as the incredible acreage that we have to enjoy uh, walking far out away from the, the noisy uh, and in the old days smoky city uh, into the cooling breezes of Lake Michigan. Bathing beaches uh, came a little bit late to Chicago. Uh, the first at Diversity, I think, in around 1908. Uh, over at the left, a, uh, an image showing uh, kind of the view cone of this picture over to the right and you can imagine what it would have been like to go bathing in those days in the long bathing costumes. You know I'm sure Chicago's more intrepid teenage boys had been uh, swimming in Lake Michigan since the city's beginning but uh, respectable people did not until the park districts in the early 20th century finally began building these specialized facilities. Here's a colorized version of, uh, I, again, I think this must be the Diversity Bathing Beach, but I have not found any confirming information on that. And of course, today, in a normal summer, we would all be enjoying Chicago's lakefront beaches on a day like today. I don't need to uh, tell any of you who are on this call uh, what you'd rather be doing on a day like today in Chicago. Uh, whether it is getting in the water or just sitting near it or just watching the people who are doing one or the other of that. We mentioned the shore protection 
that is necessary here on the west side of Lake Michigan. And I wanted to just take a second to explain what goes on. Because we have uh, predominant waves that hit our shoreline at this particular angle, coming from the northeast and washing onto the, the, uh, the sand or the gravel, whatever uh, our beach happens to be, when those then when the swash becomes backswash, uh, going back out to sea or back out to Lake Michigan, it picks up and carries with it a tiny bit of the material on the shoreline. And so this is why if you put a groin or a structure perpendicular to the shoreline out into the lake, it will catch the sand and gravel on the north side of it, on our side of the lake. And so we have known this since the city's beginning. It is how we have protected our harbors and how we have kept our beaches from washing away, uh, is to uh, thrust those groins out into the lake. And that's what a number of the things that people fish from uh, along the North Lake Front actually are intended for is to protect uh, the, and just keep our shoreline from washing away. Nonetheless, every winter, uh, several uh, thousand cubic yards of our shoreline does disappear. Uh, the park district will pile a lot of it up in windrows further inland, but in a bad winter, a lot of it disappears and we have to go to Indiana with trucks and buy it back from uh, Indiana and uh, uh, replenish our beaches uh, along Chicago shoreline. In more recent years, the Army Corps of Engineers has uh, been building these airplane landings, uh, these uh, uh, concrete revetments along the shoreline of uh, uh, Lake Michigan, not as um, natural looking, but no less artificial than the blocks of Indiana limestone that we uh, used from the 1920s through the 1950s to harden our shoreline. Now there's a whole legal aspect to the protection of Chicago's lakefront. And I'm happy to get more into that in the questions afterwards, but um, uh, there's a whole book that I've been uh, involved with that will be coming out next year, a couple of law professors writing about the legal history of Chicago's lakefront. I'm sorry, I don't yet know the final title of that book. To me, it's just the Joseph Carney and Tom Merrill book, but uh, it'll come out from Cornell uh, University Press. And this covers uh, the fights with the Illinois Central and then the later fights about both the public trust and the public dedication doctrine, which are slightly different things and work a little differently. But one of the upshots is that the area that has been landfilled uh, is held in permanent trust for the citizens of Illinois and if the General Assembly gives it over to the Park District for park purposes only, that does not allow its transfer for private use. Now, what is private use? Well, we only have a few decisions. They don't give us the, uh, the full picture yet. Uh, we know that Using it for to expand a steel plant is not public enough. Using it to expand Loyola University, not public enough, even though there was going to be a public walkway along the shoreline. Uh, we suspect that using it for the Lucas Museum may not be public enough because uh, the lease transferred it, uh, gave exclusive control to the museum. But in the end, that case was never actually decided. Lucas just took their ball and went to Los Angeles instead. So uh, these are intriguing legal questions to a lawyer like myself. Uh, uh, maybe uh, they're not to the general public, but as I say, I'm happy to discuss what I know about uh, some of that and, uh, and what we still don't know about some of that. Now, a decade ago, I also was involved just doing the publications and the maps for Friends of the Parks 
last four miles effort. And I know that uh, this has a little bit of a bad reputation in some uh, parts of Edgewater, but I will just uh, say that it was the effort to make the last uh, four or four and a half miles of Chicago's lakefront truly public parkland, the way that the first 26 miles are. And there are places, uh, particularly in the South Shore neighborhood, that still retain riparian ownership, as well as in Rogers Park. Most of the buildings in Edgewater that think that they have riparian ownership, in legal point of fact, don't. It was purchased from them uh, back in the 1920s by the Lincoln Park Commission. And uh, so, you know, the last four miles, which really never came to anything, uh, could not interest city and public officials in it or uh, big funding efforts in it, uh, not yet anyway, uh, it was uh, a very carefully drawn plan that was going to uh, use kind of the minimal amount of landfill necessary to make the shoreline both public and protected. Well, the public part didn't go over real big with some Edgewater condo associations. But the protected part uh, might soon be of much more interest to some of these associations. And uh, I'll just uh, skim through a couple of the, more of the, the renderings of that to talk about the shoreline protection problem that uh, is coming back to be very present in our minds these days. So uh, many of you will remember the shoreline flooding of the late 1980s and uh, here in South Shore got rather aggressive up to and into some of the buildings and that is happening again. So this is, uh, I believe just last winter, uh, you can see the flooding of the uh, street and entrance to the garage at this South Shore co-op or uh, apartment building. And uh, I think this is just a couple of weeks ago. You can use the uh, groins at Montrose Harbor to do your best walking on water videos because the water is actually overtopping these uh, groins that protect the entrance to Montrose Harbor. The other thing that's going to change our perception of the lakefront in the next few years is the reconstruction of North Lakeshore Drive. And I know a number of you are probably involved with the with, uh, Illinois Department of Transportation's outreach effort on that, what exactly that's going to look like. There are some proposals out there. We don't know that all of these are gonna be in the final plan or funded, but uh, there are some proposals, some discussion of dramatically expanding the landfill here at Oak Street Beach all the way down to Ohio, as well as north along the, uh, the slab or the, uh, I don't remember what we used to call that, uh, I guess the slab, uh, up to division, uh, from division to north. Uh, and uh, some more details of what the pedestrian and vehicular flows might look like uh, once that's done. There's been a lot of discussion, at least in the circles that I run in, uh, transit activists, about whether there can be de dedicated bus lanes as part of the North Lakeshore Drive rebuild. Uh, I think most recently, IDOT seems to be leaning toward lanes that are shared uh, high occupancy and busway. We're not sure also if there will be uh, the right-of-way taken from the park to give the buses their own entrance and exit ramps, which is really the bigger part of the problem, especially at places like uh, Belmont uh, in the afternoon rush. Here is an image that uh, is at Foster Avenue showing how they might reconfigure some of the pedestrian, uh, the bicycle paths, as well as uh, making a sort of a single point interchange with one stoplight that would control the access between Foster and Lakeshore Drive. Well, I guess there's two stoplights, aren't there? Uh, another view of the potential for Oak Street 
and uh, that kind of winds up the uh, the images that uh, that I have uh, put together to show. So let me just put this up here. I uh, uh, went ahead and uh, typed in a couple of books that you may be familiar with or want to look into. Uh, the first one is a fairly basic history of Chicago's lakefront and the uh, struggle to make it public that Lois Willie did back in the 1970s in kind of our, our first uh, efforts to really bring attention to the public character of Chicago's lakefront. Uh, back when the lakefront protection ordinance was put in place and other things. The second, a more recent and uh, more detailed book about the history, how Chicago's business and civic leaders uh, decided that uh, between the countervailing needs of commerce and recreation for Chicago's waterfront. And uh, I do, I really recommend this book. I've done a lot of reading in primary sources, but uh, Josh Saltzman uh, came up with a lot of stuff that, and, that I had never seen, and more importantly, synthesized it all uh, in a way that I had not really thought about, looking even into details of Great Lakes shipping and things that I had never uh, thought were all that important as we talk about the shift of uh, the commercial activities from the downtown and even north side lakefront down to the Calumet region and then its eventual decline uh, as the railroads took over a lot of the cross-country freight hauling. There's uh, quite a number of amateur websites about Chicago history. One of the best is uh, chicagoology.com. Uh, I maintain a little website just called chicagoandmaps.com that is a pointer to all of the historic Chicago maps that I find scattered around the internet and uh, encourage you to take a look at that and explore uh, not only the ones that I have posted there, but the collections in various libraries around the world that I am pointing you to. And finally, if you have any specific questions, I am delighted to have emails from any of you at the address there at the bottom, or uh, at this point, you can type them into the chat, or um, I guess we can uh, even possibly unmute uh, people if they uh, raise their hand, and, uh, uh, and uh, I'll be able to actually hear you uh, ask the question. So Greg Borzo is first with something that I should have mentioned when I uh, had the image of the notation on the plat up there. Forever open, clear, and free technically applies only to uh, that part of Grant Park between the south line of Randolph Street and 11th Place. Now, 11th Place never really existed as a street, but you can kind of imagine where it would be between 11th and Roosevelt Road. And so this is the reason that the old band shell, uh, if, if you remember the one from the 60s, uh, even very early 70s, was south of 11th Place, uh, in Grant Park was because it was a structure that might run afoul of the permanent injunction uh, that uh, prohibits any buildings in the main part of Grant Park. More recently, uh, we have uh, had a discussion, uh, details about uh, I guess this was now a decade ago, my how time flies, uh, that the Children's Museum decided that it wanted to move from Navy Pier out into Grant Park. And who was really encouraging this, of course, was the owner of the parking garage that has all these unused parking spaces. So they were going to transfer part of their underground parking garage to the, uh, the Children's Museum. And of course, all those school buses and visitors would have to park somewhere, right? So they would have new patrons. Uh, at any rate, uh, that fight included lots of technical details about the only above ground structure was going to be north of the south line of Randolph Street. And that might have actually allowed that uh, to be built in the protected part of Grant Park. But we never quite got to that um, 
uh, to that place. And uh, so uh, the Children's Museum thankfully stayed out at Navy Pier. The rest of Chicago's lakefront does not have that protection, the forever open, clear and free. Instead, we have only the largely unknown protection of the public trust doctrine that I mentioned earlier, and the rather toothless protection of the Chicago Lakefront Ordinance of 1973. Unfortunately, that ordinance, excuse me, <coughs> that ordinance only requires the plan commission to give its approval to things that want to be built along the lakefront. Well, with the plan commission entirely under the thumb of the mayor for all of Chicago's history, basically, that just means that if the mayor is in favor of a project, whether it be the Children's Museum or the Lucas Museum, uh, the plan commission just digs out its blue rubber stamp as well as its red rubber stamp, and it's approved that it can go in the lakefront protection zone. So let's not count on the lakefront protection ordinance saving our bacon from anything that uh, might be proposed on Chicago's lakefront. Uh, Greg asked, why did it come up regarding Lucas Museum? Well, not very many uh, newspaper commentators or members of the general public really understand the highly complex and interlocking legal protections. And so uh, people will write newspaper editorials that invoke forever open, clear, and free uh, because the details of the public trust doctrine are just, uh, uh, they're just hard to, comprehend uh, as a slogan. <laughs> I guess I'll put it that way. Are there other questions coming into the chat or is there a, another uh, place that people are asking them? I think I'm unmuted now. This is John again. Um, that was really an outstanding presentation, Dennis. Um, it's very, very relevant to the uh, rising lakefront exhibit we have at the museum right now. Unfortunately, that exhibit shortly opened shortly before all the lockdowns due to COVID went in place. And as Bob mentioned, the museum is still closed for uh, general operating hours, but um, I would like to put out there um, that we are open for small private tours of groups of maybe at least five and no more than 10. Um, so we can arrange those not only on our normal weekend hours, but throughout the week. If anyone's interested in assembling a small group and coming out to the museum, please um, follow up with us on our, uh, through our website, and we'll try to make that happen. Therese um, Callahan asks, uh, uh, can I speak about race and how that influenced who had a say in the planning process? Well, Chicago's racial history um, is, uh, has a lot of unpleasantness in it. And of course, those who dominated the planning process, uh, certainly through the uh, end of the 20th century, would have been uh, the uh, almost entirely white downtown and uh, uh, in industrial dominated business establishment. Uh, but uh, you know, the Chicago politics are pretty complex with uh, the, the South Side's uh, black submachine, as Elizabeth Taylor uh, calls it in uh, her book, American Pharaoh, uh, run by uh, uh, Dawson. I can't remember his, his first name. Uh, the Bill. Bill Dawson. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, but I think uh, the South Side black belt, uh, I think their interest in the lakefront uh, was much more modest than their interest in access to economic opportunity, the jobs in Chicago's industry, uh, and of course the, uh, the uh, lowering of uh, restrictions on housing 
so that the black belt could expand modestly. And at least, uh, I remember Dawson and uh, Richard J. Daly were very interested in uh, keeping uh, the black uh, residents uh, kind of under machine control. And that is one of the things that, uh, uh, shall we say, shaped their approach to housing desegregation. But that, again, is far beyond the scope of this uh, talk. In more recent years, of course, we have uh, seen open recognition that the south side is cut off from its lakefront by the, uh, the wide 10-track railroad uh, right-of-way of the Illinois Central, today's Metro Electric and Lakeshore Drive. And so we have a number of new overpasses that have been uh, built. In most cases, they are not new access points, but they are at least much more attractive overpasses that allow access to Burnham Park. Uh, okay, Mark uh, Zachikowski uh, asks, uh, yes, the excavation uh, for the Congress Superhighway was in fact the dirt that was used to do the landfill from Foster up to Hollywood uh, in the early 1950s. Where did all that exactly. dirt come from? from? When the west side went to the north side. Exactly. Yep. Yep. Oh, Last four miles, okay, Denise McIntosh, last four miles to be filled in with what? Um, I think the primary uh, landfill material was going to be the dredgings from Lake Peoria. In order to keep the Illinois waterway uh, open, the uh, Army Corps of Engineers uh, every couple of years does a substantial amount of dredging out of Lake Peoria, which is a wide spot in the Illinois River. And they put all of the dredgings on barges and bring it to Chicago, where they put it in what's called the confined disposal facility uh, outboard of uh, Iroquois Point. So if you follow 95th Street all the way east of the lake, you will uh, get to uh, something called Iroquois Landing, which is uh, Chicago's most modern port facility. And uh, just on the east edge of that, there are these uh, enclosed, are these uh, seawalls that mean that even if there is some heavy metal uh, contaminants in those dredgings, and, and there is, uh, that it uh, will not, we hope, leach out into and pollute Lake Michigan. And so I think the proposal was to have an even more substantial cell enclosure that would uh, be along the seawall side, but that what was essentially just silt from the bottom of Lake Peoria could be used to do the bulk of the landfill. And then it could be topped with uh, the, the new earth, as it's called, which is the uh, sludge that's dried at Chicago's sewage treatment plants. And once again, that has a certain amount of heavy, heavy metal content to it, just because of the things that we flush or uh, uh, throw down the drain in any urban area. But uh, as long as you enclose it and then top it with clean uh, topsoil, uh, it should not leach out into the lake in any way. And because it's been sun-dried uh, and nowadays is even sterilized, uh, there should not be any pathogens in that new earth that would uh, uh, also create any, uh, any uh, pollution problems. But this is a little beyond my area of expertise. Uh, uh, Friends of the Parks uh, did have uh, the consultants on, the, on, on their team that could speak very explicitly to those concerns. Uh, all right, Raymond asks, uh, how much spent on the new lakefront? I have not researched that, uh, you know, uh, our attitude is always, well, it's federal money, it's free. And uh, so uh, uh, I don't have any of those figures about uh, how much the new revetments and the uh, modest expansions that have been done at Fullerton and down at 31st Street Beach 
uh, have cost. I think the same will be true of anything that's done in conjunction with the um, with Lakeshore Drive, the North Lakeshore Drive rebuild, that because there is enhancement money in the uh, highway uh, trust fund, uh, that can, I think can be used for such things, that at least 90% of that will come from federal gas tax money, and the other 10% would probably come from uh, uh, state gas tax money. But uh, it's not... Uh, unimaginable that the park district will be throwing in a few million as well for the final landscape touches uh, on whatever happens there. Uh, Can I ask Dennis a um, question I posted earlier, do we have any idea what the costs were of those landfills from a hundred years ago and how those were paid? Uh, I don't have those figures right at my fingertips and of course, I'd have to translate them to modern dollars, which is a little bit of a tricky process when you're talking about things that were very labor intensive. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, so, no, I, I can't just at this moment off the top of my head give you any, any figures. Josh uh, Saltzman's book uh, includes some of that. Let me mention another website, uh, the uh, just called Plan of Chicago. Dot org uh, that I did for the centenary of the Burnham plan back in 2009. And that website is still up. It includes a web version of a booklet that I did. And if some of you are interested in actually getting a physical copy of that booklet, uh, email me and I will see if I can make arrangements to get that to you. It's also available as a PDF uh, as well as the website version that's on planofchicago.org. All right, Mark asks about the metal projections coming out of the lake near the rocks between Foster and Hollywood. I think what you're talking about are piers that, uh, I don't mean piers in the nautical sense, um, vertical uh, steel beams that have been driven into the lake bed in order to hold back um, horizontal sheets of wood or steel and that is what is holding the artificial bottom. One of the problems that you have when you do landfill this far out into the lake, you know you get out this far from the original shoreline and you're in 40 feet of water well, you can't put a bathing beach for toddlers in 40 feet of water. So what we have done is created artificial bottoms for uh, the uh, beaches and how the beaches kind of go out under the surface of the water. And so those are held by uh, these posts driven into the lake bed. And usually that's where the life guards uh, sit in their lifeboats because they don't want anyone swimming that far out. Of course, it seems to me that in the last 15 years, they don't want anyone swimming out far enough that their feet don't touch the bottom, but uh, uh, that's just my grumble with, uh, the, the, with the Park District lifeguards. Celeste asked about uh, the disappearance of uh, uh, beaches four, five, and six at North Avenue Beach, and I'm not quite sure what you mean, but I think that's just rising lake levels that have inundated those uh, parts of North Avenue Beach. North Avenue Beach, of course, has, what is it, eight or ten groins that uh, project out into the water and form the sand uh, or rather the sand collects behind those groins. But I think that the lake level is so high this year that uh, some of those have just disappeared underwater. Or they were not replenished because the lake level is so high. As I mentioned earlier, every year the park district goes and buys many truckloads of sand from uh, Indiana sand mining operations along the, the, the dunes there and uh, transfers it back to Chicago's beaches. 
So I guess they just didn't replenish the, the, the ones that were going to be carried away anyway. Uh, all right, so, uh, Raymond asked, Raymond Vol, uh, how can lakefront property north of Hollywood, Hollywood Beach to Evanston be protected? Who will lead the way? Well, I suspect there's going to be some kind of uh, big three-way compromise between the lakefront landowners, the park district, which actually owns much more of the lakefront property than people realize, and the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, who comes up with the money? Who consents to the hardening of the uh, shoreline on the water side of their property and uh, what the park district insists on to make it look recreational in character. And uh, that's gonna have to be hammered out uh, as a compromise among those three parties. The city of Chicago will be involved to some extent because it has the, the property of the, uh, the, the uh, streets that actually end in the lake, especially in Rogers Park, but some other places as well in Edgewater. And uh, so there'll be a minor player in part of all of this. But as uh, Robert Reamer reminds us, of course, uh, the last four miles plan, uh, which we already have, would adequately protect all of those shoreline properties. It's just that some of those shoreline property owners uh, uh, did not, we're not uh, on board with the last four miles, but uh, faced with a special assessment of millions of dollars to keep their condo building from falling into the lake, uh, they may be a little bit more on board with it now than they used to be. Patrick Kenny, expansion of uh, Lakeshore Drive all the way to Evanston. Uh, I know of no one who is proposing that. Uh, the last four miles explicitly excluded that possibility. I don't think the current park district would be on board with it. Um, I will say honestly, and because I am 800 miles away from any uh, thrown vegetables or rotting produce, that I don't think it would be the worst idea in the world to take federal money to let Lakeshore Drive go as a uh, partially um, below grade four lane parkway uh, as far as uh, Calvary Cemetery, the Evanston property line. And especially if we had uh, decks over it at least every half mile, uh, the way that the transverse roadways through Central Park are largely covered over and invisible. But that doesn't mean that they're silent. And uh, that is uh, another issue with enjoying the, uh, the North Lakefront is the constant noise of the traffic on Lakeshore Drive. So obviously it's a mixed blessing uh, to be able to uh, relieve auto traffic and accept uh, the big pot of federal money that the motorists give us uh, but in return, we have to accept them uh, being primary users of the park. So. Uh, all right, John Holden uh, is, uh, mentions that uh, we don't know what the cycles of the lake are going uh, forward, and indeed that's true. Uh, we don't yet, you know, uh, we haven't been writing down the lake levels for more than 120 years yet. And so we think that there's kind of a long-term cycle and a, and a short-term cycle. Uh, Tom Skilling just had this in his Ask Tom column last week, uh, what those exact periods are. And I uh, don't have that right in, at my fingertips, but uh, yeah, we, we just don't know when the lake might recede again as it was 10 years ago, we had wide, wide beaches at the street ends up all the way up through Edgewater. In fact, you could walk on dry land all the way from Hollywood up to, uh, I forget, uh, Devon, I think, uh, maybe even uh, all the way to Loyola Park, but uh, that is no longer the case. Uh, uh, let's see. 
eight miles of revetment in place to help prevent planting uh, and uh, need another eight miles to stop current flooding probabilities. Well, of course, that would include a certain amount of uh, park protection because there's not eight miles of, of private ownership left. There's really only uh, less than four miles and uh, probably only about two and a half miles that are true riparian ownership because a lot of those Edgewater condos, uh, condo associations is what I mean to say, don't in fact own their riparian rights, even though it looks like they do. If they go check the property records, they'll see that uh, those were transferred back in the 1920s from the uh, predecessor property owners. And looking back up uh, to see, has Lyola, uh, Tom, has Loyola been okay with getting landlocked? Well, Loyola, as you may know, wanted to do a, a Lakeville pr uh, project much like uh, Northwestern did in Evanston in the 1960s. Doesn't seem that anyone ever raised any objection to, uh, to Northwesterns. And so we never got a legal decision about uh, whether that was okay under the public trust doctrine. The public do trust doctrine also was not quite as um, robust in the 1960s as the later environmental movement, especially in coastal states, made it in the 1970s and early 80s. So um, it, it's a very odd uh, legal thing that it doesn't appear can be changed by the General Assembly even. In fact, if I read the, uh, the Supreme Court decision accurately, not even Congress can change the public trust doctrine. What, was, what God made as Lake Michigan can never be taken away from the public is the basic concept underlying it. Uh, all right, let's see. But Loyola, uh, you know, their, their proposal, uh, uh, there was a, a, a good government group that sued and a judge ruled that uh, even with the public walkway, uh, Loyola's campus expansion did not have a public enough character to pass muster under the public trust doctrine. Well, one side note of Loyola's landfill plan was that uh, they were originally planning to acquire the Granada Theater adjacent to them and restore it and put it to use as a university facility. But then when they hatched their uh, lakefront scheme, they said they wouldn't have money for both. So they let the Granada go ahead and get torn down, even though they never got to their lakefront plan. All right, I'm scrolling back through the, uh, through the questions to see what I have overlooked. Uh, Greg Barzo asked, did the landowners between Chicago and Foster oppose development of the lakefront since that infringed on their property. Um, you know, I've never found any accounts of those landowners being terribly upset. And I think it's because the Lincoln Park Commission purchased their riparian rights from them. Uh, there may well have been people who had you know, promised their young bride that their mansion would always look out over the lake uh, that lived on uh, what we today know as Marine Drive or uh, Inner Lakeshore Drive down in the Meekerville neighborhood. And so I'm sure there were little dramas probably reported in the newspapers even. Uh, I just have never gone and searched them out. But elsewhere, it appears that many of the North Lakefront landowners expected commercial development to be one of the uses of their property. And after Great Lakes shipping both declined and moved to the Calumet region, uh, after the uh, extension of the Milwaukee Road Railroad never gave them the, the railroad access over on the lakefront. They um, uh, 
had to kind of take the money uh, for development of the North Lakefront as residential instead. And uh, residential development typically saw the advancement of the park as an asset rather than a liability. 